Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. I'm glad to have you here with me once again. Today, I have a brand new guest joining me today. The beautiful Amira Hall is an author of Manifesting Miracles 101 and the book Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. She has experienced a near death uh, experience as well as had some profound awakenings during a spiritual journey in Peru and Egypt. And we're going to get into all of it today. She also has profound wisdom to share with us all. I think you're going to really enjoy this show. Amira, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I'm I'm enlightened just with your introduction. And uh, I think it's all about having more fun along the way, isn't it? You know, I think fun is one of the key elements that everyone needs to embrace after 2020 and 2021. Like 2022 really needs to be a year of fun. And I think things really do need to be lightened up to some degree. I think our souls need it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's important. If you can't laugh at yourself, then I think you're doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. It takes some practice. I think that's a spiritual skill all in itself. And I know you've been on your journey a long time as well. And I think maybe you've come across this, but I've heard it said that amusement is a very high spiritual vibration. So when we can be in amusement or vibrating high, everything starts to be funny, like the Dalai Lama. He's so amusing to me because he just smirks and laughs and giggles at nothing. Or the rest of us look at it and say, it's nothing. Why is he laughing? <laughs> but he sees the spiritual uh, trick or amusement or joke uh, that we spiritual beings having this human experience don't always see. I know, I know. And you're absolutely right. Uh, laughter is an incredible vibration that can shift an experience instantly. It is one of the greatest ways, and I think one of the easiest ways, if you're open to it, to taking you out of one vibration that can be super low and just catapult you into a whole new vibration that it, it could take a lot longer to get to through regular methods. Laughter is just, a, it's, it's a huge catalyst. It, it's like almost like a, a quantum catalyst for, for us when it comes to vibration. And, you know, I don't know why. Normally I wouldn't do this right now, but I just feel, you mentioned it. You just triggered me. So the quantum field, if we just brought an imaginary bubble in right now filled with amusement and then just dropped it in the top of our head and let us let it filter through our entire body and our organs, we can just shift everything right now and bring our, us into alignment with creating miracles. So I'm all about it. Enlighten up, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, you've got a pretty incredible story. I'm excited for you to share it with um, my audience. And, you know, you, you, it seems that so many of us, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, that we can push ourselves and push ourselves uh, to the point of exhaustion. I think we just need to do more. We need to do more. And we're constantly striving for something or many things. And it can lead to a lot of burnout. And that's something I think that you, I think was maybe one of the opening, the door, the doors that opened your journey for you. Can you start sharing uh, your story with the audience? Yeah, I um, was on the fast track, on a career track, and I was earning six figures in the late 90s, um, very successful, and thought I was happy. Um, and then my marriage fell apart. I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and the doctors told me death or wheelchair, and my dad died. And so it was like a gut punch, but everything within six months, I just came crashing down and pretty much stepped away and lost everything. And it was a long journey of rebuilding myself, rebuilding my physical body first, because without our health, we have nothing, right? And I think my will and my, 
you know, perseverance is a good thing, but it can also be a double-edged sword, I found out. <laughs> you know, like you said, you push and you push and you push till your breaking point. And you're, it's usually before you realize it. Yeah. So I had to get real quiet. And part of my healing was learning about yoga. That was in back in the early 90s, actually. Um, and learning about yoga and meditation and also getting quiet, quiet, quietening my mind that was always jumping around trying to figure things out. And once I started healing and rebuilding that, then I felt I got back into the career track again and, and really started making and manifesting even more. Um, but then I, I felt like there was something missing. And that's when my journey took me to Peru. I started hearing this little voice in my head or a song and I didn't know where it was coming from. I really thought I was losing my mind because nobody else heard it except for me. And before, before we get to Peru, before we get to Peru, it's, it's pretty, it's a big deal what you went through. You know, you're all within a six month period, you know, because you kind of just glazed, you just glazed over this and this is pretty big. Um, your father passed away. You're going through a divorce, correct? Mm -hmm. And you were diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah. And back, in, back in those, those days, we didn't have the internet and most doctors, they were starting to be in this zone of anything that they couldn't diagnose. They lumped it into chronic fatigue. It was an autoimmune deficiency basically. And we see that this since then, two decades later, it's actually accelerated. More and more and more people have autoimmune disease. And, you know, when the doctors told me death or wheelchair, those were my two options. It was devastating. It was devastating. I cried and cried and cried. And I was new to the U.S. So I didn't have a, a large circle of friends. I didn't have a huge work, you know, community. Um, and now my husband was gone. So that I had built my whole life around that. So it was down to ground zero and trying to find some medical support. Finally, it was, it was a blessing because believe it or not, it was an astrologer. I was trying to, I was going down the track of what's going on here. This is super crazy that all this stuff is happening to me. And this astrologer referred me to a naturopath who then told me, he goes, you've got emotional issues. That's at the root cause of your autoimmune. So that was such a refreshing thought to me. And that's when it started me on the path of alternative healing. And quite mm -hmm. honestly, what we've all been through in the last two years, I wasn't really, I, I, was, I, I was more afraid of what the government was going to do in terms of shutdowns than I was of me getting sick. You know, I knew from exactly what to do to keep myself strong and healthy. And I've been talking to people for the last, I would say, seven years, very strong to all my clients, take care of your immune system, take care of your immune system, take care of your immune system, your gut detox. And so that's, a, that's an integral part of who I am and what I do all the time. So, and, and, you know, later on, I learned that not only detoxing on the physical level, spiritual level, emotional level and mental level is key to us awakening to our incredible gifts that we all have here to fulfilling our potential and just living a rewarding life. You know, yeah, all yeah. those parts of us have to be in balance. I relate a lot to your story in a sense of, um, you know, my spiritual journey really started as well with, a health issue, which I was divinely guided to a natural path through very, you know, just, it was kind of like this flash came in my mind while crying, you know, finding out the news of my, the health issue I was dealing with. And I saw, I started seeing my naturopath at the age of 20 and yeah, a lot of the journey is clearing the emotional blockages. Yeah. Well, I would say that's the core reason mm -hmm. I would say, because if, you know, um, 
Well, I'm sure, well, and I, I was going to go down the path of genetics, but I don't believe that anymore. I was just reminded with Dr. Bruce Lipton's comment that, you know, your perception sets what you see as reality and that sets your DNA. So we can literally change our DNA and everything else with our thoughts. And what I've focused on over the last 22 years is releasing those thoughts that I didn't know I had. That's the unconscious parts of us, right? The hidden parts of us that got us sick. What were some of your thoughts that kind of got you sick that you didn't realize you had? Well, not necessarily thoughts, but I'd say emotional trauma. I was raised with an alcoholic father. Okay. I think my mother was an, not, she was an enabler. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I, and I was just a very sensitive person, you know, as I, as I am today, but, um, I, my family didn't get me and I'm sure I talked to lots of clients. They say the same thing. It's almost like the soul family where nobody got us as <laughs> we were growing up. Right. So there was that, and I think it's all divinely orchestrated anyway for me to forge a path and, and break away from the clutches or the belief systems or that little, you know, tribal structure. Um, the medical system did me a favor 30 years ago by telling me death or wheelchair because I learned that I'm in charge and not to give over my power to someone else. Because that's a pretty strong statement to tell a patient. And considering you are nowhere near <laughs> that state right now, and that was what, how long, 30, over 30 years ago? It was over 30 years ago. And I would say today to anybody, I mean, when I work with clients, their physical ailment or what's ever causing them their, their physical condition, it starts with emotion. So back to the question, I was, um, I, I was, I was an out of control empath. Mm -hmm. I was trying to unconsciously fix my family, the, the dysfunction. And at the same time, nobody understood me. So the way I explain it to my students is when foreign energy gets stuck in our body, it creates dysfunction, dis-ease, and death, death of dreams, death of your well-being, death of your goals, death of relationships and careers. So it's all strung together. So when we're sick, we have to come back to the basics and start with the beginning. Where else mm -hmm. to start, right? I like a metaphor like this. When our soul comes into the human body, it's pure energy and it has a purpose, but it's coming into the fetus in the mother's womb and it knows nothing else but that it's matching the vibration of mom, her feelings, us through just osmosis, her feelings, her beliefs, her experiences, and it becomes us unknowingly because we are matching it. Then we're born. We match dad, we match siblings, we match friends, and then our teachers and our religions and on and on and on, co-workers. So we are one compilation. I like to call it an archive of information from the day you started. And then there's this past life stuff too. We could get into that. But we're this archive of information well, we long forgot a bunch of stuff, right? Oh, that happened when I was five. Oh, I've long forgotten. Or that relationship. Oh, you know, that's so long ago. I'm over it. Well, your body and your energy field isn't over it if you haven't sorted it out or released it. And so it's this process of shaving away and releasing that which we are not because we are not those feelings. We are not those experiences. And they are in another time, past time. Mm -hmm. And so it's a process of learning how to be present in the body and clear, clearing ourselves with all of that baggage, you know, modern psychology calls it baggage or, you know, uh, what memories, beliefs, um, ideas, thought patterns that we, that are, may, may not be correct. Did you have a breakdown at any point during the you know, six months of everything kind of piling on. It's like the universe just 
piled on and piled on everything all at once or I would I would also like to say you your soul probably chose to pile it on all at once I was a type A personality and I think Nicole I cried for six months I mean with with the acupuncture two sometimes three times a week chiropractic once a week uh, part of my my um healing was to go sit in the beach for one hour and do nothing just watch the waves um and learning meditation and yoga yeah i had a lot of meltdowns you know i'm highly emotional cancerian girl so it felt like my whole world was against me and my family didn't come to be with me when i asked for them so that was i felt abandoned i felt like a loser i felt inadequate in every way and had no hope when my dad died I mean, my bank account was getting dry and thank God when, oh, thank God dad died. I mean, no, he left me a small amount of money that really sustained me. Other than that, I mean, it was all a miracle and divinely so of, of trying to truly allow that. Yeah. That's really difficult to be at your lowest and be still rejected by your family in a sense of at least the support that you're looking for. Yeah. And you know, they couldn't, again, you know, they just didn't get me. They couldn't relate. And the, and the, I don't think they really ever were there for me. And so it was, I think, all a divine orchestration for me to be truly independent and sovereign. I have to be responsible for me, right? And um, it, and, and learning how to do that with grace, learning how to do that with with divine gentleness not be so hard on myself yeah mm -hmm. i think that was a big one for me too is being so hard on myself yeah we're a lot harder on ourselves than we realize you know if we took a moment to actually speak to someone the way we speak to ourselves we would be horrified <laughs> yeah that's a great point yeah and and we don't hear those negative self-talk um you know, it's, it was so long ago, Nicole, and I feel so different now. I feel like that was such, like it was a past life, <laughs> you know, but I think it was crucial in my growth and, and really, that's when I started detoxing. I started doing whole um, body detoxing for 30 days. And I would do the colonics for seven days. I did some very extreme things. And of course, even then at the time, people thought I was just a total freak, right? Oh, come on, have a little piece of cake. This isn't going to screw up your detox, you know? And so I was a little bit ahead of the pack in that regard, but I did it out of survival. I didn't have any other options for me. And it was, it was, it's something that stayed with me. To this day. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I totally relate because it sounds like a lot of your awakening started in the nineties, the mid, mid, mid to late nineties, somewhere around there. That's kind of when mine started as well. And so I'm very familiar with the health, uh, opportunities that were available to us and how right now it's just so easy. There's a wealth of information and treatments and herbs and different kind, everything. There's so much, but back then, without really a lot of the internet, like you were talking about, it's it really was a divine orchestration to be led to what you needed at that time. Yeah, I think the angels were carrying me for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, did your did your near death experience happen before your trips to Peru and? No, Egypt? I guess some people would lump this near this, you know, death or wheelchair as a near death. I don't construe that as a near death. Um, I when I started getting stronger and feeling like something was missing, you know, so it was a gradual, slow awakening for me. Um, and, and then the call to Peru is when I, I started feeling like I was going to die on that trip. In fact, I cried. <laughs> all the way from San Diego to Lima, Peru on several flights and strangers were just holding me because I was just sobbing and sobbing. I, the tears wouldn't stop. I felt already like I was dying. 
like there was a part of me that was cracking open and just falling away. I think this is very common in uh, that this is why a lot of people just, you know, they think that they're broken or they think they're breaking down and ultimately it's not. Yeah, I'm crazy. You definitely, but it's not ultimately you who's broken. It's the ego, the illusions, the false identity that's finally breaking and really setting, liberating the soul free from all of that. However, it's, it's very painful because we have such an attachment to the identity that we've uh, used up until this point. And that's what's cracking and breaking. And at the time, I didn't know anybody on the trip. I was going all by myself. And I didn't know that I was in like a, 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 I call it a growth period, right? I was at the precursor of what, an opening and shedding to receive what was next. And so all of this makes perfect sense in retrospect. But when you're going through it, it's at the height of, like, I thought maybe the plane was going to crash. I wrote letters to every single person in my family and told them how much I love them. And do you know, they brushed it off. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So that's what I, it's, but still, I did it for me. Not yeah. For yeah. Me. And I understand that there's a level of vulnerability that comes through this whole journey that is necessary in order for you to open up your own heart, which essentially opens up your own intuition and your ability to, and capacity to completely embrace your life in a much more fulfilling way. But it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt when that happens because we're so, I mean, your family is your family. And if there's anyone who, you know, is supposed to have your back, it's, it's your family. Uh, at least that's what we'd like to think. And that's so, a belief system we've all been taught. Right? Yeah. It, and so is, the hard is. truth is I would say the majority of clients that I talk to don't have a loving, supporting, you know, compassionate family. Mm -hmm. I think so many people on this journey can relate to that. So many people I know I can, even to this day, um, there are certain family members that just don't understand me and don't want to really know anything about what I'm doing. Luckily, my parents are incredible now. We have a great relationship. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, but it's it still hurts. It really hurts. It makes you feel like you're a leper or something, like you've got some kind of disease that no one wants to catch you know if they're if they listen to too many of your words or too many of your thoughts it's like an infect their own mind or something like that but did you see people's life reviews while like at some point in your journey yeah um we're fast forwarding now to egypt Okay, well, let's not get to Egypt just yet. Yeah. There's so, so many, there's so many stopping points, Nicole. Oh my goodness! I'm sorry. See, this is why your journey is so it's it's so deep. There's so much going on here. So, okay, you're on the plane in Peru. You're, you people are holding you. Cry. Strangers are holding you while you cry. Yeah. Then I got to Peru and everything stabilized. Um, I was going on a journey in the Amazon with a shaman. And that's pretty much all I knew. I didn't know what ayahuasca was, but I was stepping into an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, from what I understood is that there's a lot of people that vomit. And there I am, and all these people are grossing me out, right? Um, and because I had detoxed for 30 days before I got there, I didn't barf. And there was two other ladies that had done many uh, ceremonies. They didn't throw up either. So, but... But for me, what happened is I thought my head was going to crack open. And the shaman, there was two or three of them praying over me and praying over me and praying over me. And I didn't know what the heck was going on, except my head was going to explode. I found out later they didn't want to do the ceremony because somebody, they got the message that somebody was going to go blind. I found out that person was me. And interestingly enough, when they were praying on me and praying on me, there was like a waft of gray smoke that came spiraling out of my sixth chakra, my third eye. And in that moment, I knew that I had been working with a guy in San Diego that was a spiritual teacher or slash shaman. And he was plugged into my sixth chakra, sucking my power and my juice out. 
like a Klingon or like mm. a vampire. And I was stunned. I was so shocked. But that released, the headache started to fade. And then it was later that I found out that I was the one that was going to go blind. And, wow. and interestingly, because it's the sixth, the third eye and my vision. So if that energy could, could or would stay stuck, it could block my spiritual abilities. Probably to this day, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and or never realize the fullest potential of that aspect of myself. And so, you know, and looking at just that, I realized how important it is. Again, this is another level of detoxing for me, right? And clearing off my energy centers to really opening up my spiritual gifts. And I think that's where a lot of people, they think, oh, I'm just going to switch on my pineal gland, right? There's a big buzz right now. I want my third eye open. Really? You don't know what you're dealing with, you know? And it's a process of integrating all of the chakras, not just flipping on the third eye. Um, yeah, you need, you, yes, uh, because the energy needs to be moving between all the different chakra centers in order for... Otherwise, you'll probably it, have a cracked head like I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, this is very interesting. And I think this is actually quite common where a lot of people, when they start to awaken or they, a lot of their senses start to open up and they're looking for advice or help and teachers and mentors. Unfortunately, just within any industry, there are predatory type people. Now I'm not saying that your shaman um oh no was he was he was oh he was oh he was i found out <laughs> i was... trying to give him the benefit of the doubt <laughs> no i know where you're trying to go but yeah he was so were you still in touch with him when this was all happening like were you still working with him to some degree before this happened well it was one of those things when i'd go to a weekly gathering and i was introduced by another friend and so I just sort of went along. So it wasn't like a, a formal a, agreement or attachment or commitment to a, an ongoing program. But I, in that, at that time, I knew that I had to separate from those people. So when I went back, I had to sever those ties. And one, the lady that brought me and got me involved, she used to be a roommate of mine. So we were quite close friends. And I told her that I had to stop being friends because I, she was still plugged into them. And it was almost like a hopscotch. My energy was still being, you know, funneled through that group. So it was a hard lesson. And it was one of really standing up for myself and trusting that the information I got was actually accurate. Because I don't like yeah, to throw away I, friends it, for it, it, no reason. It's so important for people to recognize that, that, um, you know, you know, it, 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 depends it depends on, on how, how well, well attuned, attuned you are to your, to your energy, energy field, field and how sovereign you truly are in your own beliefs. beliefs. But when you're, but when still, you're still learning, learning and you're new to all, to all this, this, your energetic, energetic boundaries, you're still, you're still learning, learning everything. everything. It's really it's hard, hard to know what's, what's yours, yours, what isn't, isn't yours. And so, and so you do you go, do through, go these through these phases, phases where you have, you have to, kind to kind of remove yourself, yourself from certain relationships, certain, certain situations, situations, all of that. But then, but then as, you as you get stronger, it's all about reintegrating. But of course, not that you're going to go around and hang out with energy that is truly there. To siphon, siphon, but, but I it's, think, I think these lessons are hidden from us, but when you start to realize you come home and you don't feel good, or let's say your natural abundant flow just stops or a lot of like negative things start happening. Um, those would be signs, but I really think this is important. You and I touched on it when we first connected and that is, you know, for people to vet out you know, their next teacher or who they want to work with. I think it's highly important to get to know them at some level, to have some level of trust and to have your own boundaries, like start with a small training and experience it and see how you feel different rather than going all in. You know, I have a client who invested over $10,000 with a training and it's just a cut and paste kind of program that anybody could have downloaded from the internet. Right. And so it's like, there's, there's people getting, I want to say brainwashed 
marketing appeal um, and tricked into, you know, false, uh, let's, let's call them experts. Because yeah, false anybody, experts, that's a good one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because you can brand yourself nowadays and you're on the internet and everything looks polished and shiny and glittery and all full of gung ho energy. But, you know, when you get into the meats and potatoes, you know, it's not, it's a hollow shell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of that. You and I were talking about that um, last time about how there are a lot of people just parroting information as if it's their own information and they haven't done the journey that would give them access to the oh, inner the wisdom knowing, like that and cellular inner wisdom. knowing yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and I there's a lot of that out there and but i mean this, I, I do believe, though, they play a role for all of us to fine tune our discernment um, muscle, you know, like that's part of the journey as well. And so I don't, I don't kind of like every, you know what, light and dark plays its role. So, I but you just totally want to be aware of it. Well, and it can derail you in your process. That's the other thing. Like, I'm grateful that that man was in my life and I got unplugged from it really quick. But mm -hmm. after that time, I'm very, very, you know, slow at making a decision with who I'm going to uh, allow to be my mentor. I'm very, um, yeah, select, even even with body workers or anything. Yeah, because I'm I so agree. sensitive. I, um, and I, you know, it's I, I, I wonder if you get this too. I have people who reach out to me all the time and say that they're willing to offer me free sessions, you know, whatever it might be healing Reiki and, you know, at, it's it's a kind gesture, but I think a lot of people have to understand that the healing journey is a very intimate journey, and you do, you don't want to be soliciting yourself to those. You got to have enough trust in your own power, in your own methods, that whoever is meant to work with you will find you, uh, and that you one you should never give your services away for free. <laughs> Um, just to everyone out there, you know, unless there's like a, some kind of mutual energy exchange of some sort. Well, there's always but, got to be. And if there isn't, it's going to fall flat in its face and somebody's going to end up hurt and bitter and resentful. So, yeah. I, but I think it's important to understand how intimate the healing journey is and that there is a level of safety that should be created between you and the practitioner you're working with and vice versa. And like you said, there it requires you getting to know someone. Like you shouldn't just trust. Like you said, sign up for a ten thousand dollar course without really knowing what you're getting yourself into. Well, even in the work I do, I I don't like to do single sessions with people. I want to deliver a, a result, and you're not going to get the results that I expect or that you desire in one go. It could happen. But like, I don't sell more than four sessions. So we're going to get to know each other. You're going to get to trust me. You're going to get to feel it and know it and experience it for yourself. It's like, you don't have to prove it to me because I already know it works, but you've got to prove it to yourself. Mm. See the difference. And then it's a grounded experience of the next level of trust. Because yeah. I think that's what's been really missing is people just do this download drive through methods thinking, yes, it's going to happen fast, but it's all fly by night. Mm -hmm. And that is not a spiritual journey. It is no. not fly by night. It is not a downloadable activation. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's really juicy and, and, and uh, desirable, but it, it's It not. requires commitment. It's a soul yep. level commitment mm -hmm. and it's an inner yeah. eagerness to want things to be different. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, so you leave Peru and you go back home, but still something is missing. On one of the journeys in Peru, I had a vision of myself coming through a diamond shape star opening. And that's when I knew I came through the earth to the earth as a star seed in early Egypt. And then I knew I needed to go to Egypt. 
That was okay. that was the the hook. And and when I came, I'm like, well, great. I don't have the money. I don't know how that's going to happen. Okay, spirit, if um if I meant to go, I'll have the money. And I just let go. Sure enough, I got a flyer, and I was off to Egypt a year later. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you take off to Egypt, you get there. Were you experiencing any familiarity energetically for yourself? Were you receiving any, not necessarily, maybe memories, but, or just like, again, familiarity as you got there? I remember the first time stepping in Egypt. Now I've been back 12 times. So, um, but the first time and every time I go, I feel home. It's the strangest thing and the people I just felt my heart fill up with my people and yeah I I mean the the journey through Egypt and the sacred temples and the meditations there and the king's chamber the vibration of that that structure is beyond words it's well beyond dimensions so you start plugging into alternate dimensions of reality and for me, that's when my perception really started to shift, like being able to see through walls or see granite statues come alive, seeing the life existing and hearing and hearing celestial music, angels singing to me that nobody else heard. So that really it was just like I was walking through the temple and and just still and taking it all in and just completely open when I heard the celestial music and I, I, I started looking around for speakers <laughs> and you know, Egypt's walls are like three feet thick. And so I was looking for cords in this ancient building. There was none. So I went to the guard, the temple guardian. And I said, excuse me, where are the speakers? <laughs> and he was yelling at me in Arabic and shouting, getting me out. He didn't want, he knew exactly what I said, but they don't like to talk about it. It's like, we're talking to the dead people or the, you know, the spirit beings. They don't want to bring them close because they think they create trouble, but yeah. Oh, they know they're very real. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I've always been pulled. I have not been to Egypt yet, but that was the first, I, I remember growing up as a kid, I have to say, I've never been intuitive as a kid that I can remember or have any of these um, experiences that go beyond like supernatural or anything like that. But what I do remember is feeling very pulled to Egypt since I was about 12. For some reason, I was like, I know I have to go to Egypt. And interestingly enough, Peru was the other one. Interesting, you know? yeah. I, when I read um, the Celestine Prophecy in my uh, early 20s, that really yep. – spoke to me like it spoke to me on a level that I didn't even understand at the time but I knew something was happening and I knew that there was truth to some of what was being written in that in that book and I knew that I had to I knew I had to go there it was like I, it's you just can sense you feel that connection to it and so much like you I do feel like Egypt is one of my um homes well, Nicole, Here. I've got a trip coming up in October. I know you do. We're going to have to talk about it. Please, everyone stick around because there's an awesome Egypt trip we're going to talk about. Yeah. Now, you're in, you're, are you in one of the temples when you start to have these visions so, of life reviews? No, Nicole, I wish it was that sweet. I guess it's sweet no matter where. There were lots of visions of various things, so many that I can't remember. And I was looking at my journals the other day going, oh, wow, I forgot that, you know. But no, I was, I'm, I was designing jewelry at the time, and I wanted some antiquities. And I had friends on the, on the west side of the Nile in the small village called Korna, it's right out, it's perched, the village is perched right up against the Valley of the Kings where all the nobles and kings are buried for, through all of time. Well, these families are digging in their back walls <laughs> into the mountain looking for treasures, right? And so I figured, God knows, some of these families got to have some little beads or something that they found over the years. So I started asking around, my friend asked for me, and so I scored some beads and I had to go back and pay for them. So there are these little, little, you know, 
they don't look like much of anything except like old uh, ceramic beads. So I went back to pay and we were in this old alabaster factory. There was nobody there. It was middle of the day, but the owner, um, Look, when you buy something in Egypt, especially if you're friends of friends, they host you. You sit and you visit. You have a talk. It's 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 sort of a little ritual, uh, you know, social ritual. So they bring you coffee and tea or Coca-Cola and water. They're extremely generous. But this time they brought out a joint. And, you know, I'm there's all of a sudden like 10 guys showed up. And, and there was only one chair. I'm the only lady. I'm sitting in this chair. They're all sort of crouched down or, you know, and, and they passed this joint around. And I said, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Well, Muhammad was screaming in Arabic at me at the top of his voice. It's the best. It's the best. And blah, 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 blah. And Arabic. I didn't understand. All I know is I don't do well with shouting. <laughs> And I was starting to shrink and going, oh, no, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I'm the only woman and all this noise. And I thought, well, you know, I've smoked pot a few times. It doesn't really do anything to me. I guess I could just, you know, acquiesce and be gracious guest. And I'll be up on my feet and we'll go. Because I had to leave. I was flying that day from, from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo, New York, New York, Atlanta, Atlanta, San Diego. So I just wanted to keep the peace. The joint went around twice. And everybody bounced up, ready to go. And me, I'm standing behind myself, sitting in the chair, but I'm standing up. And that's when I saw everybody's life review. It was like I could see their line or their life um, like a movie. And it was like, people laugh when I say this, it was like being in Circuit City. You see all these televisions lined up, right? And everything's got a different movie. And wow, it was so extreme. And I just knew I had to stay in my body. I kept trying to stay in my body, stay in my body. So I must have said something, but I don't, I didn't hear any words and or remember, but I had my hands out and my friend slowly walked towards me and they were all laughing in slow motion. And then I got the water in my hands and I remember going, getting closer to my face thinking, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> <laughs> so vain, oh right? Oh my goodness. While all this is happening, you're actually oh, yeah. like, <laughs> like well, I, I'm like not oh, in my funny. right mind, but obviously still vain enough. You know, I always blame That's, it on it's... my French jeans, you know, my vanity. Yeah, no. <laughs> But then I was you know gone. What, though, that's what makes it even more real to me. That because yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then like, aren't we funny? Ha ha! Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're such yeah. funny, silly humans. And then I was out, and I don't remember this part where they um, apparently I collapsed on the floor. My arms stiffened, my legs stiffened. They were pounding me on the chest with all their might. Um, then they dragged me out from under the arms, uh, loaded me into a pickup truck, which was a taxi in the village. And they propped me up on the, uh, passenger seat with my head out the window, barreling down the road, trying to give me oxygen. <laughs> and it was the heat of the day. I mean, the whole thing is just a comedy scene now. Um, except not so much. The next part I remember in that day was like I was a shooting star coming through the galaxy and I could see that I was headed towards a small ball way off into the distance. And that ball kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's a big place. How am I going to find my body? And once it got closer and closer, then all I heard was, it was literally like zooming in like a, a, a GPS and you're just like and soaring in. And I, I heard this language that I didn't recognize. And I, I knew I didn't know that language. And then I went, Oh, I'm in Egypt. And that's, then I went click somehow trying to connect with my body. But honestly, it felt like I was, have you ever put on wet clothes? Mm. 
or, or nice. wet wetsuit. Yeah. It's sticky and mm-hmm. and cold and gooey and thick, and you struggle and struggle and struggle. That's what it felt like to get back into my body. And I struggled and struggled and struggled. And then I remember trying to open my eyes. The light was so bright. I'm sitting next to, I felt somebody here. I couldn't really open my eyes. I could hear their voices and it's all starting to come together. Okay, that's Hajaji. I know he's sitting next to me. So I tapped him on the shoulder and then all of a sudden they start screaming in Arabic, like, oh my God, she's come back to life, you know? And I said, where are you taking me? And they said, to the hospital. And they're shouting in Arabic some more, all excited. And I'm like, hospital? (laughs) Who wants to go to the hospital? And I, I, I was in this blissful state of, I said, I'm okay. I need a bathroom. (laughs) And so again, another comedy scene, they're freaking out. They think they told me what happened and how I died, but I, I, my gut's going to explode. So I need a facility. That was another problem, Nicole, because where we were in that time period, there were no Western bathrooms in the village. They have holes holes. in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't stand up. So they were thinking, how is this going to work? Right? (laughs) Of course, I wasn't thinking that. And, And so they had to take me to a Western toilet. And so oh they goodness. figured it out, negotiated. The brother had a, a Western bathroom. They had to carry me up three flights of stairs. And while I was sitting there with my skirt down over my legs and sitting there so pretty on the throne, um, my friend Hajaj was, tears were just streaming down his face. His whole t-shirt was soaking wet. He said, you don't understand. You don't understand. You died. He goes, doesn't your chest hurt? Like they pounded me. I thought they, they thought maybe my, they broke a rib or something, but everything was nothing. There wasn't a bruise on me. And so I, it took about three hours for me to recover. And from that time when I was laying there resting, I started seeing Sekhmet, the goddess of healing, the lion's face and the female's body in the armoire, in the wood grain of the armoire. Every time I looked there, there she was. So I kept looking out the window. There was this um, sheer draperies that were fluttering in the wind as I looked out to the Nile, the green valley, just like in a movie. And I'm like, that's real. I'm going to look outside. No, nope, she's not real. No, 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 that's not real. And I was like losing my mind. But that continued. And that continued. And flew, okay, from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo to New York. That's when I got off the jetway and the busy airport and everybody looked like black and white paper dolls. And I was horrified, horrified. It was anger. It was grief. It was fear. And my perception at the time was, I don't want to come back here. This is America. It's a bad place. And of course, I, I didn't, you know, I was trying to comprehend where and what was going on, um, I feel like I entered into another a lower vibration, not America per se, the, the, a, a vibration where a lot of people existed, you know, a realm of consciousness perhaps. And, and it took me some time. By the time I got to Atlanta, I'm still reading my book, trying to not look outside at anything. And by the time I hit the fresh air in San Diego, that stopped, but I was still, I realized I was living in the land of paper dolls with anger and fear and, and grief. And that's when my journey of healing started. I went to probably a dozen psychics and they all told me something different. And that really pissed me off because I like the, the closest, okay, in 1998, the closest word I had was a near-death experience. It could have been described as an out-of-body experience. Some people tried to say, oh, you were really on a real big trip. Well, from two hits on a joint and for mm. hours and hours after, I don't think so. I went to the doctor. I thought I had a heart defect or something was wrong with me. Everything tested out okay. My amino acids were a little low, but he said, you know, Many, many, many people die of dehydration. 
So the fact that I had detox before I went on the journey and being low, perhaps in hydration, um, that and, the, and a little bit of pot just and two weeks of being on an incredible spiritually expansive trip. I think my spirit was ready to experience other dimensions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, it, it also feels though, like that experience was written into your contract, you know, like, and, and, and how it, how you get to that point, there are so many little details that can, can shift and change or whatever, but ultimately it feels like that experience was written into your contract. Um, you know, you're pretty good, Nicole, because the, <laughs> the, the, the thing that I used to say was it felt like my clock stopped and started again. Mm. And like, it's another life in this life. I think I had done enough clearing work and energetic shifting that I was truly ready to step onto my path. And that was the mark. Because from that point on, I've been doing the work I do and refining the tools I use that I later received in downloads um, of everything. When, when I was gone, that bit of information didn't come to me for a while. It was after I separated from that grief and the anger um, and my expectations of perhaps what it all meant or was. When that happened, then all the information started coming in. And the information that I gleaned from the other side was really imprinted. But there was that whole integration process for me that needed to happen. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy you shared that with us. I think that's super powerful. And I hope people understand how powerful that is to, to hear right now, because I think there is a false perception that uh, one, that when it's your time to awaken, you're just going to awaken and everything's just going to be magic. And, and whether it's like, it feels good magic yeah. or bad magic, but it, it's just going to magically all happen. And we forget that we live in a free will universe and that we are a participant, probably the most participant, most important participant in our soul's journey. And I know, I know people right now, I have friends that I know they are holding back their own awakening uh, and, and, and different routes that I think that ultimately there could be something in store for you, but you have to choose it and you have to take steps that show, yeah, I want this. I'm ready. And I think that's the big thing is you yeah. were ready. And, and I was willing to take a risk. I didn't know what was going to happen in Peru or Egypt. And they were scary. But And I went alone. People say to me, well, you went by yourself? Well, I was with a reasonable group of people that, you know, I didn't feel vulnerable or why should I be? Um, but I took the risks and I stepped into it. I said, yes. Right? All of me. And it wasn't about the money. I had to stop the story of I didn't have the money because this spiritual journey is not about money. Mm -hmm. End of story. And oftentimes if you're waiting for the money, it'll never come because it requires your faith to know that the money doesn't need to be there for the journey to happen. And the magic and the, 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 the trick to self was that, holy cow, I manifested all of this. And, and my perception was so, I had no idea how limited, even though I've been always very heightened psychically. Um, you know, I talked to dead relatives when I was a young girl, but, but I still had limits to it. I still had um, a mask on and um, boundaries of what was acceptable. And I think when I was willing to step out of that, not only my comfort zone, but really that's the magic I think of Egypt. It, it, your perception completely gets blown out in terms of even what's real. I mean, I think through COVID over the last few years, a lot of people are starting to see reality very, very different. And our, mm -hmm. our, and our priorities are shifting, right? And realizing how short of term really this human life can be. But whatever we develop here, I've been saying this for, for two decades now, is you get to take 
your development with you. And I, and I don't mean to sound morbid or anything. I am not afraid of crossing over. In fact, I struggled with being here. And I think a lot of people who have had near-death experiences that connect with the love, connect with the light, connect with the messages of the and the incredibleness of what's beyond is like, it's really hard work being here. Really, really hard. Therefore, our job is to be able to get into the flow. So it isn't so hard. And that consciousness that we remember or reconnect with that we already know gets to take us to the next level when we graduate. Mm -hmm. Because everything is designed, like this reality is designed to take you out of the flow, right? Um, you yeah. know, in a sense of work you really hard, uh, you know, having all those belief systems that are very disempowering, like everything is really designed to take you out of the flow. So yeah, if you're able to, surrender and find that. I was literally just talking to a girlfriend about this yesterday that I, in, when I was 31, I took a one year sabbatical um, off work and I started off in Costa Rica and I'm very much like a type A, you know, very need to have control over anything, need to know what's going on, like what's my next step. And in a sense of like, there's certain things I want to have planned. And that trip I purposely created so that the only things I actually had planned was the hostel that I knew I was going to stay in when I first landed in San Antonio, and then a 10-day silent meditation retreat. After that, I was like, I'm just going to go with the flow and see what happens and see where that takes me. And like you, when you were kind of sitting on the beach, you, your part of your therapy was just sitting on the beach and watching the waves and doing nothing. You know, part of my therapy was, okay, what am I going to do today? And I'm like, I just think I'm going to sit in the hammock and read a book in the jungle. And I remember sitting in the hammock one day doing that and thinking, gosh, like this is hard because your mind wants you to feel like you're wasting your time. Like there are other things you could be doing. And then you can start thinking about like, well, I'm not making money right now. And it's just, we're so programmed to be busy. And you said, you, you, uh, we talked about this on Friday and I love this quote. You said, I can't receive, I'm too busy. And that's one of the big blocks when it comes to manifestation with people. So can we talk about that? Because I love that. That's so powerful. Yeah, I think, where do I start with this? When I teach the concept, if, if, if you can, like, if you really desire something like with the law of attraction, let's use a car. Okay. And you want this new car. Let's say it's a, a Mercedes. That's a common car, a luxury car. You can have it. You can say, yes, I've got that picture on my, my, my uh, vision board and I'm going to manifest it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to create it and, and have it in my mind. You can have it energetically, but can you receive it? So it's like a flip side to the same coin. It's an energetic, let's call it magnetism that you literally pull into you rather than having to take effort to make it happen. I don't know yeah. if I'm, 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 no. So, so here's, you know, I hear, I heard something really powerful today. Really powerful. While I was at the gym. Instead of having a to-do list, what if we had a to-feel list for the day? So f receiving is tied with our feelings, but mm -hmm. at the same time, what if you just focused on that, like gratitude, gratitude and, um, and the highest level of gratitude creates this chemistry of abundance. It's or like you're literally plugging into the matrix, the universal, everything. Yes. And also just even going back to the very first thing we were talking about at the beginning of the show, fun, like tune into the feeling of what it would feel like to be driving that car. You know, how fun would it feel for you? How like picture like the windows down, open roads, you know, driving and the, where would you drive to and just open up all the possibilities. And when you can actually connect to the feeling that you would feel, you will pull whatever car, just since we're using that as an example, 
whatever car is going to elicit that feeling for you. And ultimately that's the, what, that's to me what matters the most. And if you can anchor, you know, up the game and just carrying that gratitude throughout your day and amusement and, and being open to whatever shows up, it can be bigger than what you've expected or what you've got on your vision board. It can just blow. Yeah. But that's what I call your being able to receive the abundance of the universe because there's no energetic blocks there interfering because you're already plugged into it. You're plugged into that dimensional, everything exists already in form and thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we get in our own way with trying to intellectualize that and even trying to make a formula for it or understand it. We have to bypass that. So it's an experience. It's not in our head. In fact, we were talking about, um, you were talking about the book, The Celestine Prophecies. And I think it was shortly after that time, my guidance was stop reading. Stop reading what everybody else is just copy and pasting in more books. Get your own information. Tap into your own knowingness of what you would want to receive from the universe. Maybe it's just a smile. Maybe you need acknowledgement from other people. Or support from your family. <laughs> or not. Maybe I have other family, right? Maybe, maybe that's not. it. Maybe, maybe my expectation of what they, because they're family, of what it should look like actually blocks mm. it. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. dissolve that and have no expectation on it, perhaps they'll step up to the plate. Yeah. Right. Very well said. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all comes back to me. I like the saying when there's a finger pointing outward, there's three pointing mm -hmm. back at me. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. all me. And I know, I know when you're hurting and when you're on the floor in a ball crying, nobody wants to hear it's you. I mean, I didn't. I really hated my teachers and mentors that said that, you know, I want to punch them out. <laughs> but the truth is it's your vibration. Maybe not you as your personality or you as a heart, a soul. No, but you're creating it through your frequency. That, that's less blame, isn't it? And I like that because when we can just go, Hey, so that baggage that I had from a kid, with dysfunctional family, alcoholism, da, 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 da. It's just energy. And it's not like anybody's to blame. It's just energy. Mm -hmm. Clean it out. Done. End of story. Yeah. I love that. Well, you've got a very exciting trip to Egypt coming up. Do you want to tell the audience uh, what you've got planned? Yeah, well, there's a lot planned. I don't have the itinerary memorized. But we, on the last, second last night, we're going to be in the King's Chamber with a private ceremony lining up with a star soul activations in the King's Chamber on the full moon eclipse, a very, very powerful spiritual um, moment on the planet, um, expanding spiritual awakening and ascension um, that will help accelerate your gifts, abilities, um, and then some. Um, along the way, we've got lots of really incredible, cool things. My co-host of the tour, she's an astrologer and an Egyptologist out of Miami. And uh, so we're setting everything up for a five-star tour um, that's for spiritual light workers and seekers, um, or just soul seekers, you know, somebody that's always had it in their heart to connect with Egypt. Yeah. Oh, awesome. And so if people want to get more information about that, I'll leave um, the links below the video awesome. and in the podcast notes for everyone. Yeah, and you have a stress buster that's kind of like a free gift for everyone in the audience. Yes, Tell us about that. yes. Please go to my website. It's stress buster. It's like an energy shower so that, you know, wherever you're at on your path right now, you can just start clearing some of those energetic blocks that we mentioned in our conversation today and just start letting it all go. And just let your natural spiritual uh, flow um, grow and, and magnify and draw to you what your soul desires. Oh, 
That's good. I think spiritual hygiene is important. So any kind of energy shower is always good. <laughs> well, Amir, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us today and for downloading everyone with your story and the wisdom that came with it. I think everyone in the audience will take a lot from this. And to the audience, thank you so much for joining me again. I love you guys. Have a wonderful week and remember to stay in the light. Thanks again for joining me for another show on the Enlighten Up podcast. I love you guys so much for all of your continued support. So remember to raise your vibe, find your tribe and be open to the infinite possibilities held in the mysteries that surround us all. Thanks again for sharing the show with your family and friends. And if you're new to the show and you need to find out more information about me, please head on over to my website, NicoleFrolic.com, where you can join my newsletter. And please follow me on Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Keep your light bright and I'll see you next week.